911. What's the location of the emergency? My, my daughter is missing. What's your address, ma'am? She's gone. We can't find her anywhere. I've called all her friends. How old is she? 11. Okay, what's her name, ma'am? Carly, C-A-R-L-I-E. And last name? Brucia, B-R-U-C-I-A. The footage you just watched shows the last known moments of 11-year-old Carly Brucia as she was abducted in broad daylight by a violent predator. Despite being reported missing by her parents within half an hour of her disappearance, Carly's case would ultimately go down in history as one of the most depraved crimes against a young girl. It all started on January 31, 2004. Carly had spent the night at a friend's house, but the following day was Super Bowl Sunday, so she wanted to get back home in time to watch the game. She told her friend's mother that she was allowed to make the walk back home on her own and departed around 6 p.m. However, after she left, the concerned parent reached out to Carly's mother, Susan, and informed her that Carly was walking the mile back home alone. Susan said she didn't feel comfortable with her daughter walking even just a few blocks alone, so she sent her husband and Carly's stepfather, Steve Kanzler, to find Carly and drive her the rest of the way home. However, as Steve went up and down the route Carly would have walked, he couldn't find her anywhere, and that's when the nightmare really began. Steve continued to drive around for over an hour, praying that he had somehow simply missed Carly, but when he returned home and she still wasn't there, it became clear that something was seriously wrong. Susan later said of this moment that she instantly felt something terrible had happened to Carly, saying, In my heart, in my mind, I knew. Susan and Steve left the house together to search again, shouting Carly's name out the car window as they drove down the road. They stopped briefly to investigate a wooded area and noticed a red tow truck drive slowly by them. Then they continued retracing Carly's steps and went to her friend's house to check there. And much to their surprise, they saw the same red truck parked out front. It struck them both as very odd, and upon realizing that Carly wasn't there either, Susan decided it was time to call for help. The frantic mother dialed 911 around 7.30 that evening. She couldn't hide the absolute terror in her voice. 911, what's the location of the emergency? My, my daughter is missing. What's your address, ma'am? And your phone number? Okay. Has she been missing before? No. She had a fight with her girlfriend. She decided to walk home. And we've been driving around for about an hour and a half. Uh -huh. And now um, it's not an hour and a half walk. She's gone. We can't find her anywhere. I've called all her friends. How old is she? Eleven. And when was the last time that she was she was seen? It was at six o'clock, Jim. Okay. Yeah. Around six o'clock. And she was at a friend's house? Yeah. Okay, what's her name, ma'am? Carly, C-A-R-L-I-E. And last name? Brucia, B-R-U-C-I-A. She's just shy of five feet. Okay. Do you know how much she weighs? She's around 120 pounds. Okay, what color hair does she have? Dirty blonde. And what color eyes? Blue. Following the heartbreaking call, police immediately issued a BOLO, or Be On The Lookout alert for Carly, and searched the surrounding area for four and a half hours, but found nothing. Meanwhile, Carly's family and friends got to work creating missing persons flyers with her face on them, and they began handing them out the next morning. But something happened during this time that struck a few people as suspicious. Carly's stepfather, Steve, allegedly visited a local equipment rental business to hand out flyers and asked one of the employees if he could purchase drugs in a couple of days after this whole thing blew over. The employee thought it was a very odd thing to say when his stepdaughter was missing, so he contacted the authorities. Detectives also felt that something was off with Steve, so they brought him in for questioning. He stated that he'd been at home the entire time with Susan, which she was able to corroborate. After fully verifying his alibi, he was cleared as a suspect, but Steve did offer them another name, Ron Choquette. Ron was the owner of the red tow truck, and he'd apparently been dating the mother of Carly's friend for two months. He was home the night Carly slept over, and at one point, he was the only adult present. So, naturally, Steve informed police about how he'd noticed Ron's red truck driving suspiciously around the area they were searching. Investigators followed up with the lead and spoke with Ron, but he told them he'd left for work before Carly left the residence and that he didn't see anything out of the ordinary. 
Moreover, his co-workers verified his whereabouts, leading police to rule him out as a suspect in Carly's disappearance. Officers returned to Carly's home the day after her disappearance and spoke with Susan again. She insisted that her daughter had never run away before and that this behavior was completely out of character. However, statements made by Carly's friend suggested otherwise. She said Carly had been upset the night before and expressed negative feelings about her family several times. Carly also allegedly said to her friend at least once that she didn't want to go home because she had too many responsibilities. This revelation made officers second guess whether or not Carly might have just run away from her friend's house on her own free will. Still, investigators couldn't rule out the possibility that she had met with foul play. So before leaving the residence, they gave Carly's mother some very horrifying instructions. They asked her to contact her daughter's dentist to obtain her dental records, just in case they would be needed to make an identification. The next morning, Carly's classmates arrived at school to find her seat empty, and around the same time, authorities brought in tracking dogs to aid in their search. The dogs followed Carly's scent to the parking lot of Evie's car wash, which wasn't part of her expected route home, but was a known shortcut. While the dogs ultimately lost her scent near the back of the building, the company had several surveillance cameras, and what they captured sent a wave of fear through the entire community. The manager of the car wash reviewed the tapes and told police he saw what appeared to be the abduction of a young girl, recorded at around 6.30 p.m. The unknown man walked casually at first, as if he was going to pass by, but at the last moment he took a large step toward her and grabbed her arm. He likely appeared quite threatening, as he was standing directly in front of her and was blocking her escape. She likely felt terrified and panicked, and it's possible that he told her that everything would be okay if she did everything that he said. As a general rule for abduction situations, it's safer to put up a big fight early on. The abductor is likely looking for an easy target. If someone is fighting against them and screaming, the abductor may be afraid of attracting too much attention, so they retreat. You can teach your children that if they're alone and approached by a stranger who's trying to get them to go somewhere, they need to be as loud as they can and try to get away before they get into a vehicle with that person. Once they're alone in a car with someone, that person has complete power and will likely take the child to a secluded location where they are familiar with the surroundings, so it will be much more difficult to escape. An abductor may try to persuade a child to come willingly by claiming that as long as they do what they're told, they won't be harmed. Or they may tell the child that they will take them to their parent or that their mom asked them to pick the child up. It may be a good idea to come up with a safe word for you and your child. Teach them that unless a stranger uses that safe word, they should not get into a car with that person, no matter what the stranger may say to try to convince them. You'll need to practice this safe word frequently with your child so they don't forget it. To their horror, Carly's parents quickly confirmed that the girl on the tape was their daughter, but no one recognized the strange man who approached her and forcibly let her out of frame. However, the footage clearly showed that he was a white male of average height with dark hair and tattoos on his forearms. He was also apparently wearing a jumpsuit with a name tag, but the video wasn't clear enough to read the name. In the footage, it seemed evident that Carly didn't recognize the man as he moved into her path and said something before grabbing her by the arm. Within hours, the startling footage was being played constantly on local news stations, and while hundreds of tips flooded in, most proved to be dead ends. Investigators began to fear the worst as more time passed, but later that day, they finally got the lead they'd been waiting for. Several people called in saying they firmly believed the man in the footage to be 37-year-old Joseph Smith, an auto mechanic with a lengthy criminal history dating back to 1993. In fact, he was out on parole for a drug bust at the time of Carly's disappearance. While most of his run-ins with the law were for drug offenses, at least two crimes on his record involved violence against women, including kidnapping, aggravated battery, and false imprisonment. One of Joseph's co-workers was among the tipsters, and two days after Carly vanished, he stated to police that the man in the footage strongly resembled him based on his mannerisms and clothing. Moreover, another employee claimed that he seemed nervous and appeared to be under the influence of narcotics at work the day after Carly went missing. They also reported that Joseph had been struggling at work due to issues with drugs and money, and claimed he didn't show up for his shift the previous day. At this point, authorities decided to review the security footage from the car wash again, hoping to potentially connect Joseph to one of the vehicles captured on the tapes. They gathered from his co-workers that he drove a brown Lincoln Town car, but they said it had recently been out of commission due to transmission issues. 
Regardless, the only vehicle that stood out was a pale yellow Buick station wagon that pulled in approximately three minutes before Carly's abduction. The car appeared to drive by before briefly entering the car wash parking lot. The abductor may have seen Carly walking as he drove by, so he turned into the parking lot and decided to take her. It's also possible that he'd seen her shortly after she left her friend's house, and he then followed her to the car wash. Regardless, he'd likely thought about abducting a child long before he actually did it. When he saw her walking alone, he may have saw it as the perfect opportunity to act out his fantasy. Unfortunately, detectives couldn't make out the license plate or who was behind the wheel from the grainy footage but they knew it was time to pay Joseph a visit. Officers arrived at the home of Joseph's friends, Jeffrey and Naomi Pincus, where he was renting a room after being kicked out of the home he shared with his wife and three young daughters. However, despite seeing Joseph outside smoking a cigarette when they first drove by the residence, they got no answer when they knocked at the door. Authorities spoke with the neighbors, who claimed they'd recently seen Joseph talking with a woman outside, who they believed to be his sister. They also expressed confidence that Joseph was still inside the residence and hadn't left. Joseph's sister returned to the property, and after speaking with the police, she went inside to locate her brother. Joseph finally emerged from the house and claimed he didn't hear detectives knocking at the door because he'd been sleeping. Investigators asked Joseph where he was during the time of Carly's disappearance. He explained that he'd been at home watching the Super Bowl and told them his friends could verify his story. They showed Joseph an image taken from the surveillance video, and while he admitted that the man looked like him, he insisted he was nowhere near the car wash that day. Next, detectives asked Joseph to roll up his sleeves, and they found that he had tattoos on his forearms just like the man in the video. They also noticed several minor cuts and scrapes on his hands. As if that wasn't suspicious enough, Joseph also admitted to borrowing Jeffrey and Naomi's yellow station wagon the day Carly went missing. However, he claimed he only drove the car to a nearby marina to look at the water before returning home. Police were feeling pretty confident that they had their guy, but when they spoke with Naomi, she confirmed his alibi, leading them to second-guess everything. Roughly an hour after detectives arrived at the home, Joseph's probation officers came to assist by conducting a thorough search of his broken-down Lincoln Town car. They quickly located drugs in the vehicle, including multiple syringes and spoons, and Joseph was arrested for violating the terms of his probation. Later that same day, Jeffrey, Joseph's friend, contacted the police with some unsettling information. He claimed that Naomi had gotten the dates mixed up when giving her initial statement to the police, and that while they'd let Joseph borrow their station wagon on the day in question, he didn't return until the following morning. Jeffrey also said he'd reset the odometer before Joseph left, and when he checked it upon his arrival back home, over 300 miles had been driven. Not to mention the inside of the car appeared disheveled, and the back seat was left down. Finally, when asked if he could recall what Joseph had been wearing when he left the house, he said a mechanic's uniform. Jeffrey and Naomi consented to have their home searched, but authorities found nothing of evidentiary value. Then, after hearing of the arrest, Joseph's mother stormed down to the auto repair shop where her son worked and demanded to know why the employees had called the cops on her son. However, despite her angry outburst, his co-workers felt that she too believed it was her son on the CCTV tapes when she proclaimed, if Joe did this, I will get the truth out of him. Joseph's mother saying if Joe did this is an indication that she'd allowed that possibility into her head and hadn't dismissed it. A mother who 100% believed her child was innocent would likely say something that was much more firm, such as he didn't do it. Meanwhile, investigators continued searching the wooded areas around where they believed Carly had been abducted, but to no avail. They also contacted forensics personnel from the city of Sarasota sanitation site and requested that they secure the transfer building for an organized search of the trash the next day. Little did they know that by that time, the search would no longer be necessary. While Joseph was in custody, one of his longtime friends entered the police station and asked to speak with investigators. Beyond telling them that the man in the CCTV footage looked very much like Joseph, he informed them of several occasions when he would talk about his growing desire to assault women. Shortly after this encounter, detectives transported Joseph from jail to police headquarters for a formal interview. The following interrogation footage has never been seen before. I want to just talk. You and I have some things to talk about. Okay, because some of the things at the house, we got to get straight. That's the most important thing. Okay. In this room, is about the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's the most important thing that goes on in this room. 
Joseph's arms are wrapped tightly around his torso, which could suggest that he's feeling defensive and trying to protect himself. In addition, his legs are crossed at the ankles. His whole body is in a closed position, signifying that he may be uncooperative and may not be willing to speak with the detective. The initial interview never even had the chance to get started. I was already advised to talk to a lawyer. After Joseph shut down the interview by requesting a lawyer, he repeatedly asked to speak with his family. I can't talk to you. You have requested a lawyer. What about my family? Why can't I call them? You know, I want to, I want to talk to my parents or my brother. But the detective ultimately convinced him to meet with an attorney from the public defender's office. Can I, can I contact the public defender's office for you? they can bring a lawyer down here. But Joseph did have one last request. Hey, uh, did you say something? Do you think, do you think that I could smoke or not? Joseph may be so focused on himself and his wants that he thinks he'll be allowed a cigarette break, despite the fact that police are busy trying to locate a missing child. But it is a federal building. It's against the law for you to smoke in here. I mean, like outside or something. Not right now. When the detective says no, Joseph nods his head and smirks, seemingly unconcerned about the seriousness of the investigation. If Joseph had been cooperative and willing to talk, the detective might have been more lenient about the no-smoking rule. However, the detective has no incentive to make Joseph feel more comfortable, and he has no reason to reward him because he's given them nothing. So the request was denied. Then, Joseph attempted to plead with the detective again. Can I call my mom? Not right now. So what? Uh, what's uh? You got a cover? Yeah, we're working, we're working on it right now. I need to talk to you know my family, uh, see what's going on. It's understandable that Joseph wanted to talk to his family, as he likely wanted to get their advice on what he should do, or so he could explain to them what happened. Joseph was eventually transported back to jail, where he finally got to call his brother John, and what he said to him confirmed everyone's worst fears. On February 5th, five days after Carly disappeared, John contacted authorities and asked them to meet at his residence. When officers arrived, he told them he knew where to find Carly's body and directed them to a wooded area behind a church, just a few miles from her home. According to John, his brother had confessed to abducting and brutally assaulting the young girl, but claimed not to remember much of the incident due to drug use. Joseph may be trying to set up a defense for diminished capacity by alleging he doesn't recall what occurred and was high on drugs. The specific facts of the case will show whether this is a viable defense or not. While John was in the presence of investigators, Joseph repeatedly called him, and he became visibly upset by the things his brother was saying. At one point, John exclaimed into the phone, Did you just choke her too hard? to which Joseph allegedly replied, yes. Then he asked if he had tied her up, and Joseph answered that the body was not bound, but he admitted to violently assaulting her and leaving his DNA behind. Joseph's mother arrived at John's house and stated that Joseph had also contacted her earlier that day from jail and confessed to murdering Carly. Police then rushed to the church and they quickly discovered Carly's body partially hidden in a wooded area. Investigators speculated that she'd been dragged to that location based on the presence of abrasions on her right side. An autopsy later listed her cause of death as ligature strangulation and noted that she had also been brutally assaulted. In addition, linear marks on both of her wrists indicated that she had been bound at some point. Forensic testing revealed traces of Joseph's DNA and hair fibers on Carly's body and clothing, and he was subsequently charged with her murder. Adding to the case against him, a search of the yellow station wagon revealed two hairs consistent with Carly's, as well as several fibers matching the shirt she was last seen wearing. Investigators theorized that after borrowing his friend's car, Joseph had taken a combination of drugs, and that's when he noticed Carly walking alone. It was just a chance encounter that caused him to kidnap, assault, and murder the innocent 11-year-old. Meanwhile, the community was outraged that Joseph had been able to walk free in the first place after having been convicted 13 times in the last 10 years of various crimes. Furthermore, around a month before Carly's abduction, a Florida judge had been requested by local authorities to issue a warrant for his arrest based on probation violations. Yet, 
The judge never did because allegedly the police hadn't completed the necessary paperwork. On October 24, 2005, Joseph Smith was found guilty of first-degree murder, as well as separate charges of battery on a child under 12 and kidnapping. He was sentenced to death by lethal injection for Carly's murder and life without parole for the other crimes. However, on July 18, 2017, a judge vacated Joseph's death sentence based on a new bill that required a unanimous vote by the jury. The jurors in his original trial had voted 10-2 to 2 in favor of the death penalty. Joseph ultimately died in prison while awaiting a new sentencing hearing in 2021.